Father, we know that our human minds, our human hearts don't naturally understand or desire your truth. We don't naturally run to them, and we certainly don't naturally want to be submitted to them. It is only by the Spirit of God that we can understand them. Paul wrote that in 1 Corinthians 2, 14. The natural man does not understand the things of the Spirit of God, for they are spiritually discerned. And so, Lord, in our own strength, and our own wisdom and understanding, we cannot understand your words that you have for us this morning. And so we come asking to hear from you, asking you to open our ears and our hearts, our minds to your truth, because we need it. You're not pleased just because we come fill a seat on a Sunday morning with your people. You're pleased when we open our hearts to hear your truth, to be willing to be changed by it, and to be committed to living in obedience to it. You're pleased when we open our hearts and our mouths in praise to you. You're pleased when we encourage each other to live right, to do right. You're pleased when we bear one another's burdens. And there are heavy burdens here this morning. You're pleased when we delight in you. And gathering with your people and praising you and giving to you, giving our hearts and our minds and our lives to you is what you call us to do. That's why we gather. We don't come to earn brownie points. We don't come so other people can see that we were at church. We come to delight in you. You are rejected by many. Many people see no need to go be with your people on Sunday. Even some who would call themselves your children see no need to do that. But Lord, you have called us to come together regularly so that we can do the things that we have already mentioned and that we have sought to do this morning. And so we ask for the help of your Spirit to open our eyes and our ears to the truth. And we pray this not only for ourselves, we pray this for our brothers and sisters at Grace Bible where we will be gathering tonight as Kevin ministers your word to the people there this morning. May they have ears to hear and hearts to obey. And We pray for our dear brother whom we have never met, but he is our brother in Christ, Pastor Andrew Brunson in Turkey, imprisoned now for his faith and his trial which will begin a week from tomorrow. All for preaching Christ. They have fake, bogus charges against him that we know are simply because he is a follower of Jesus Christ. And yet Jesus said, people will hate you because they hate me. Encourage his family. And Lord, would you work a miracle in that court that they would not do what we expect they would do but that you would turn their hearts that they would have no choice but to set him free. Nevertheless, your will be accomplished in his life and continue to administer the grace you promised to him and to his family back in North Carolina. We thank you for the privilege of calling you Father. You hear us and you answer us. We pray all of these things in the strong In mighty name of Jesus, the King of kings and Lord of lords, amen. Matthew 21, I invite you to turn with me there, Matthew 21. Authority. 
It has been defined as the power or right to give orders, to make decisions, to enforce obedience. The right to act in a specified way, delegated from one person or organization to another. Inherent in this definition is the privilege, the power, the control that one has over those in his, under his or her authority. Authority is good. It is necessary in society and it is ordained by God. Romans 13, among other places. There are numerous forms of authority mentioned in Scripture. You have governmental or civil authority. You have employer authority. You have parental authority. You have spiritual authority. And last but not least, you have divine authority, God's authority. Human nature, corrupt and broken by sin as it is, has what I, I think are two main attitudes toward authority. And the first attitude human nature has towards authority is, I want it. I want authority. I want to tell others what to do. I want to be in control. A second attitude towards authority is to resent it when we don't have it. I don't like being told what to do. I don't like not being in control. Sin, at its very root, is an authority problem. Am I going to be the king of my life and do what I want? Or am I going to allow Jesus to be king of my life and do what he wants? And this is the issue at hand that we find in our text that Jesus is in and being challenged with. This is just two days now after he had his triumphal entry into Jerusalem and the people were waving palm branches and shouting, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Remember, we jumped ahead in our Matthew study to talk about Christ's death and his resurrection over the past couple of weeks. Now we're backing up to where we had left off. This is two days after his entry into Jerusalem, three days before he's going to be hung on a cross for sins that he did not commit. And today we see the king's authority challenged and ultimately rejected. The king's authority rejected. Look at Matthew 21 and verse 23. And when he, that's Jesus, entered the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came up to him as he was teaching and said, By what authority are you doing these things, and who gave you this authority? Jesus answered them, I also will ask you one question, and if you tell me the answer, then I also will tell you by what authority I do these things. The baptism of John, from where did it come? From heaven or from man? And they discussed it among themselves, saying, If we say from heaven, he will say to us, Why then did you not believe him? But if we say from man, we are afraid of the crowd, for all they all hold that John was a prophet. So they answered Jesus, We do not know. And he said to them, Neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. What do you think? Well, let, let's pause there. We'll, we'll pick up there in just a moment. These chief priests and these elders, these are the religious leaders of Israel, knew full well that Jesus had not gone through the formal rabbinical training the training, the ordination process, if you will, for the rabbis. They had a very strict uh, process that they went through for a man to be able to achieve the rank, the status of rabbi. And they knew Jesus hadn't been through that. That's how they had gained their authority as an elite spiritual leader of Israel, but Jesus hadn't done that. So who does he think he is to say and to do the things that he has done by what right or whose authority is he doing it? Because it's certainly not the authority of the rabbis. Now, you remember some of the things he's just done. A couple of days earlier, as he came into Jerusalem, they were worshiping him. And he didn't stop them. 
He healed people, and the children were praising him and worshiping him, and they, he didn't stop them. He was receiving praise and worship, and he cleansed the temple. He drove out the people in the temple who were making money, who were stealing from people, taking advantage of people, and he was very stern with them. He said, my house is to be called a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of robbers. He was very stern and strict as he ran them all out. And these guys were over all of that. They allowed all of that. And here is Jesus, this guy who doesn't have official status as a rabbi, acting on, on authority, and they want to know where it's coming from. They can't deny his authority. I mean, he's healed people. They can't deny his power. But where does it come from? That's what they wanted to know. And so they ask him this question. <laughs> and Jesus does what he often did when asked a question. He would respond with a question of his own. And he says, okay, you have a question, so I'm going to ask a question. If you answer my question, I'll answer your question. <laughs> and his question was not, or, or his response, I should say, in question was not at all an attempt to evade their question. He was not trying to stall to buy some time to figure out how to answer. His question was directly linked to their question. The answer to his question would provide the answer to their question. That's the connection he was wanting to make, and they were too afraid to make the connection. They were unwilling to make the connection. They were in a dilemma. If we say that John's ministry and his authority was divine, that he was God-ordained, then, then he's going to say, why didn't you listen to him? But on the other hand, if we say that it was purely of human origin, his ministry and authority was pu purely man-made, then these people are going to rise up against us. In fact, when Luke is telling this story, Luke says that the men said, the people are going to stone us if we just say that it was human origin. They were afraid of the response of the people. They didn't like to do this very often because they were so proud and arrogant and prided themselves of being experts on religious matters and spiritual matters. They had to do what for them would have been very embarrassing and admit, we don't know. And we don't know, while it was embarrassing to admit, was the better way out for them because they were in a corner. They wouldn't be able to win either way no matter which answer they gave. The one they really wanted to give that it was just purely human authority, would have riled, riled the people up against them, and their fear of man kept them from saying what they really wanted to say. We don't know. We don't really want to answer what we think is what, what in essence, they're saying. And, of course, that's a blow to their pride and arrogance. Jesus knew all along that these guys were not teachable guys. They were not genuinely wanting to know the truth. They were, in fact, trying to get Jesus to say that he was of God, he was of, human, or he was of divine authority, so that they could pin on him a charge of blasphemy, which would, be a charge, which would be blasphemy for anybody other than Jesus. They wanted to be able to pin blasphemy on him so they could condemn him to death. He knew they weren't wanting to know the truth. And that's why he wasn't going to oblige them. You see, what nat human nature tells us, human nature wants to question God's authority when it doesn't fit our narrative. This is not what these guys were used to. The power and authority that they were used to came through the tradition of the rabbis and officially being pronounced a rabbi. This did not fit their narrative at all. They weren't used to this. They didn't know where this was coming from, and they didn't like it. They viewed Jesus as one who was infringing on their turf, taking some of their followers away and turning their followers away from them and to Jesus. And they weren't going to put up with it. And see, you and I sitting here today, 2,000 years later, we can look at this and we can easily see the wicked motives and agenda of these men. But what we don't so easily see is how we too question God's authority when it doesn't fit our narrative. 
Why does it have to be this way, God? This isn't what I like. This isn't the way I'm used to it. That's what these guys were saying. This is not how we're used to this happening. What, how is this really good, God? How can this be fair? God, what right do you have to bring this or allow this into my life? That's what these guys are saying. What right do you have to come in here and turn things upside down like you have done? Human nature wants to question God's authority when it doesn't fit our narrative, but it doesn't, it doesn't stop there. John MacArthur says it very clearly. When a person steadfastly refuses to hear God's truth and to receive His grace, God may choose to withdraw Himself. Jesus immediately follows up this question by these men and their failure to, to answer this challenge, this rejection of his authority, he follows it up with three stories, three parables. We're going to look at the first two today, and the third one we'll look at, Lord willing, next week. And each of these three parables shows a person or a group of people who, because of continued disbelief, unbelief, and willful rejection of truth, lose their privileged status. And they lose it to someone not very likely someone who most people would consider to be despised. And that's exactly what MacArthur's speaking of. When a person steadfastly refuses to hear God's truth and to receive His grace, God may choose to withdraw Himself. So let's look at the first parable Jesus tells, and this shows us that human nature wants to reject God's authority, especially when only lip service is convenient. Look at verse 28. He goes right on with them. What do you think? He's drawing them in with a question. A man has two sons, had two sons, and he went to the first and said, Son, go and work in the vineyard today. And he answered, I will not. But afterward, he changed his mind and went. And went to the other son and said the same. And he answered, I go, sir. But did not go. Which of the two did the will of his father? They said, the first. Jesus said, Truly I say to you, the tax collectors and prostitutes go into the kingdom of God before you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and prostitutes believed him, and even when you saw it, you did not afterward change your minds and believe. Human nature wants to reject God's authority when only lip service is convenient. The explanation here is pretty obvious. It's pretty simple. The first son, in a moment of defiant rebellion, said, No, I'm not going to do what you say, Father. But soon after, he repented. He changed his mind and went in obedience. The second son readily said, Sure, Dad, I'll go do what you say. But then he didn't go. Whether he had no intention of going when he answered, Yes, I'll go, or whether he intended to go and just never got around to it, the outcome is the same. In failing to obey his father, he rejected his father's authority whatever his intention was at the outset, some would say that the implication here, he had no intention of going, even though he said, yeah, I'll go. And so Jesus says, which one did the will of his father? Notice the last question Jesus asked, they refused to answer. Now, it's kind of blatantly obvious, they can't really not answer. And so they answer, well, the first one. The first one did the will of his father. And they answer it correctly. And then look what Jesus does. He boldly makes the direct connection of the religious leaders, the guys he's talking to, to the second son. You guys claim to obey God, but your actions don't back up that claim at all. 
just like that second son said he would obey and failed to obey. Jesus went on, John was a righteous man. He was on a divine mission. Which, by the way, do you notice? That was the answer to his question earlier, Jesus' question. Hey, was John's authority from heaven or was it from man? Jesus is telling the guys, here's the answer to my earlier question you refused to answer. John was a righteous man. He was on divine mission. And you guys, in rejecting John and his message, rejected Christ. Because what was John's message? Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. They were rejecting Christ and rejecting John's message. And not only did they reject his message, they rejected the proof. What was the proof? The tax collectors and the prostitutes, upon hearing John's message of repentance, repented. And their lives were changed. They were living proof that John's message was divine. And these religious leaders refused to acknowledge the truth. You rejected the message. You rejected the proof of the transformed lives that this message was divine. And so... You religious leaders, though you think you are part of the kingdom, you are not and you will not be unless you, like the tax collectors and prostitutes, repent of your sin and believe in Jesus Christ, the Messiah that John proclaimed. Of course, they refuse to do so. The principle here is that lip service without subsequent action, without subsequent obedience, is nothing short of rebellious rejection of God's authority. Lip service, without subsequent action, without subsequent obedience, is nothing short of rebellious rejection of God's authority. It's a lot easier to say, it's a lot more convenient to say, yeah, I'll do it. When an authority tells you to do something, even if you have no intention of doing it, just to avoid the conflict that would arise if you said no. You want them to think you're going to do it, and then you don't do it. It's a lot easier to avoid conflict that way. It's convenient, and so we give the lip service. That's what human nature wants to do. Hey, it's often easy to give lip service to Christ and to Christ's truth, especially if you come from a religious background. A spiritual background, it's easy to give lip service and then not back it up with your actions. If there's any way that we can get away with just saying the right thing to keep people off our backs, but then not actually do the right thing, human nature wants to do that. Friend, hear me. Claims to believe in God practice of certain religious traditions do not get you into heaven in the kingdom of God. They don't. These guys were full of that, and that's what Jesus is telling them. And here the other side, gross, evil sins, even of the worst kinds, tax collectors, prostitutes, gross, evil sins, even of the worst kind, won't keep you out of heaven if you repent of your sin and submit to Jesus Christ, the King. Rejecting God's truth, God's authority, leads to also rejecting His servants. Human nature wants to reject God's servants when we don't like His, God's demands. And that's the next parable. Verse 33, here another parable. There was a master of a house who planted a vineyard and put a fence around it and dug a, dug a wine press and built a tower and leased it to tenants and went into another country. When the season for fruit drew near, he sent his servants to the tenants to get his fruit. And the tenants took his servants and beat one, killed another, and stoned another. Again, he sent other servants more than the first, and they did the same to them. Finally, he sent his son to them, saying, They will respect my son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and have his inheritance. And they took him and threw him out of the vineyard, 
and killed him. This second parable and the imagery created by a, a wealthy man buying land and developing it into a vineyard was a very common image that day. That's something that his listeners could have readily resonated with. They had seen it numerous times. There's vineyards all over Palestine. It was a huge part of their economy. They saw wealthy people buying land and developing it all the time. It was not uncommon as a business investment to then lease it out to, to tenants as described here while he took care of other interests and other business investments. You can tell by his attention to detail, the listing of the things that he did. He planted a vineyard, he put a fence around it, he dug a wine press, he built a tower uh, for lookouts and so forth, and leased it to tenants who, at least in his mind, he thought were good, reliable tenants. You can tell the care that he has put into his investment. He has done everything he can to make sure this will succeed. And the it was common that they would agree upon a certain percentage of the fruit for payment. That was a common thing. And then, what happens? These tenants, though they had a great opportunity to make a very good living, that wasn't enough for them. They weren't satisfied with the fruit they were getting from the vineyard. They wanted all the fruit for themselves. They didn't want to have to give any to the owner. And then they wanted the vineyard itself. It is unthinkable what they did to the servants that the owner sent. It is unfathomable what they did to the owner's son. And at some point, at this point, one might be tempted to think, this, this is so over the top. This is so unrealistic. Like, who would really do this? Kill the guy's servants and then kill his own son. This is hard to believe. And friends, that is exactly Jesus' point. Because by employing such extremes as he does in this story, Jesus is emphasizing the extraordinary patience of the landowner, which of course is a picture of God's extraordinary patience with Israel as a whole and the Jewish leaders in particular, and with you and I today. Extraordinary patience. I mean, who really would have done that? If he kills your first servants, what do you do? You show up yourself and you take care of business. You don't keep sending more servants to die and certainly not your own son, but that's exactly what God has done for us. He would be totally just to annihilate us the moment we sin the first time. That is fair. That is justice. Don't ever charge God with being unfair because God is always and only fair and he is often merciful and gracious. He does not give us what we deserve. The treatment of the various servants represented Israel's treatment through the centuries of the Old Testament prophets of God that God sent repeatedly to warn them of their sin of idolatry, to draw them back to God. And those prophets were usually rejected, scoffed, disregarded, abused, tortured, and some were killed, some in grotesque fashion. Church history tells us that Isaiah was sawed in two with a wooden saw. And then, <laughs> that's just the prophets. They're the servants, recognized by the servants. And then the son comes, and they kill the son. And right before these men's very eyes and ears is the son of God, who in three days they will also kill, hanging him on a cross. And you can imagine by telling a story of this nature with these extremes in it, he has their attention He's drawing, the in, drawing them in by such a graphic story. And then he asks this question. While they are emotionally charged because of the story, look at verse 40. What is this owner going to do? When the owner of the vineyard comes, what's he going to do to these tenants? This is just like Nathan the prophet in 2 Samuel 12 when he goes to David who has been committed adultery with Bathsheba. 
And then to cover up his sin of adultery, he murders Bathsheba's husband. And Nathan shows up and he tells this emotionally charged story about this poor man who had one sheep and his neighbor who was wealthy and had a bunch of sheep. And then the wealthy neighbor has a visitor come and the visitor comes and he doesn't want to kill one of his many sheep and he steals the neighbor's only sheep and kills it to eat. And David gets riled up in righteous anger. And he's fired up. And he says, what should happen to that wealthy neighbor? And Nathan points his finger right at David and says, you're the man, David. You just condemned yourself. And that's exactly what Jesus does with these men right here. They condemn themselves by their answer. He will put, they say to him, he will put those wretches to a miserable death and let out the vineyard to other tenants who will give him the fruits in their season. And in these guys' pride and self-righteousness, they don't realize that they have just condemned themselves by answering to Jesus. But notice the issue. The tenants in this story, their issue was not with the servants. The servants hadn't done anything to them. They weren't upset at the servants. Their beef was not with the servants. The servants were just representatives of the owner. They were doing exactly what the owner had told them to do. Go to this, my, my property here and collect the payment. They were just carrying out the commands of the owner. It was the owner that the tenants had issue with because of their greed and their selfishness. They wanted all the fruit for themselves and they wanted the vineyard itself. And so they took it out on the, on the, on the uh, servants. Friends, this is often the case with God's messengers and representatives today. Whether it's the spiritual leaders in the church, whether it's Christian parents seeking to instruct their t children and teenagers, whether it's a believer trying to help another believer or an unbeliever be pointed to God's truth, many people, even professing Christians, disrespect and even attack God's messengers because they don't like the truth that God demands that is being relayed through his messengers. That is a dangerous place to be because your issue is not with the messenger. Your issue is with God. And they answer the question. He's, he's going to put those miserable wretches to death and he's going to lease it out to other people who will give him the fruit. This brings us to the last point. In absolute justice, God will reject those who reject his son and his authority. Jesus said to them, have you never read in the scriptures? Boy, you talk about a stinging rebuke. And, and even really a bit of sarcasm that Jesus employs here because these guys are the self-appointed, self-proclaimed guardians of the truth, experts in the truth. And he has the nerve to say to them, hey, haven't you ever read the scriptures? Of course they had read the scriptures. They knew it backwards and forwards. And what does he do? He quotes from Psalm 118. We read it in our scripture reading this morning. Psalm 118, 22 and 23. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing and it is marvelous in our eyes. Of course these guys knew this passage. They knew it well, but back to the point when I was praying earlier. The natural man the, cannot understand the things of the Spirit of God. These men, though they were familiar with it, were spiritually dead and spiritually blind, and they could not understand it was being played out right in front of their eyes. The cornerstone was an extremely important to ensure that the structure that was being built was properly placed and properly aligned. 
and it had to be perfect. Many stones that were imperfect were rejected in favor, in, in, in favor of the one that was favorable for its intended purpose. And Jesus, quoting from Psalm 118, says that it is one of those formerly rejected stones cast to the side, deemed not good enough. One of those formerly rejected stones is now becoming the cornerstone. This, of course, was a re reference to himself, though he was rejected by the Jews as a whole and by the religious leaders in particular. He was going to be the one chosen. He was the chosen one. Now, to be the most important, the one that all others will be based and guided by, he will be the cornerstone. Peter declares this on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. Let it be known to all of you, this is speaking to Jews, including Jewish leaders, Peter boldly declares, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. And then look what Jesus says in verse 43. Therefore I tell you, in light of all of this, the kingdom of God will be taken from you, taken away from you, and given to people producing fruit. Since you have rejected the Son and His Father, the kingdom will be taken from you and given to those who will bear fruit. This is an indictment against the religious leaders specifically, but against the nation of Israel as a whole because they had rejected their Messiah. It was an indictment against their way of thinking that they were the people of God because they were born of Abraham. They thought it was an ethnicity thing. Abraham is our forefather, thus we are the people of God. And here, Jesus is flipping this on its head and he introduces this profound change to their way of thinking that the people of God are not those who are physically descendants of Abraham, the people of God are those who, in faith and obedience to God's truth, repent of their sin and accept Jesus Christ and His authority. It is to them that the kingdom of God belongs. And that is far more than just Jews. Praise God for that. And then verse 44, The one who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, and when it falls on anyone, it will crush them. He's going back to the statement about the cornerstone referring to Christ. Though the one who falls on this stone, this is the religious leader seeking to fall on Jesus to put him to death. They will be destroyed. They will be broken to pieces. And when Jesus falls on them, he will crush them. Friend, this is important. Those who seek to oppose and even to destroy Christ will themselves be destroyed. Paul writes this in 1 Corinthians 16, 22. If anyone has no love for the Lord, let him be accursed. And then, finally, and only then, they get it. Verse 20, uh, 45 when the chief priests and the Pharisees heard this parable, they perceived he was speaking about them. They finally get it. He's been talking about them the whole time. They had refused to hear John's preaching. They were the son who said, yes, dad, I'll go and do what you said, and then didn't go. They were the tenants in the vineyard who beat and killed the landowner's servants and eventually his son which was going to play out in three days. They were the ones Jesus was saying, the kingdom is being taken from you. You are not part of my kingdom. He's talking about them. And they finally get it. 
But what's their response when they get it? Verse 46, although they were seeking to arrest him, they feared the crowds because they held him to be a prophet. They finally understand he's talking about him and the precarious situation that they are in is trying to kill him, the cornerstone, and, the, and what's predicted to happen to those who fall on the stone. And instead of being broken in humility and falling on their face in repentance, what do they do? They become more brazen in their opposition to him and more determined than ever to kill him. But they fear the people. Now is not quite the right time, but it's going to come soon. It's going to come in three days. And this goes to back to what MacArthur said earlier. Those who continually, repeatedly reject the truth, God may well withdraw his spirit, his convicting spirit. And Jesus said in John 6, 44, no one can come to me unless the Father draws him. And when you reach that point, it is too late. You will not understand it, and you will not desire to be saved. If there is any inkling of desire in your heart to come to God, you have not reached that point. Because when you reach that point, you will be these guys right here who are called out on the carpet and you don't respond to it, but are further hardened in your evil heart. God says, I'll withdraw my spirit. And all you have at that point is your sinful, selfish, rebellious heart that rejects authority. Friends, these religious leaders had every opportunity to repent and believe in Christ. But they continually rejected him, and their hearts grew only harder and colder to the point they lost the opportunity to repent. And they had no desire to. And this happens today to those who reject God's authority and his truth. We read it in Romans 1. Romans 1, 18, through the end of the chapter, lays this out and tells us why we're in the mess we're in as a country. Because people reject the truth in God's authority. Friend, it is not enough to say, I believe. It is not enough to say, I believe Jesus. I believe Jesus came and died for sin. It is not enough to give mental assent to that. Even the demons believe that Jesus is the Son of God. It is not enough to verbally say a prayer, or to walk an aisle, or to go into a baptism. It is only a heart that surrenders to God's authority. The name, Jesus Christ, by which we must be saved. We surrender to his authority, and if you are not surrendered to his authority, you don't belong to him, it doesn't matter what you believe. Let's close this said this earlier, but it's important that you get it down. Claims to believe in God and practice of certain religious traditions and rituals does not get you into the kingdom of God. Showing up here on Sundays, even Sunday after Sunday, does not get you into the kingdom of God. And gross evil sins won't keep you out of the kingdom if you repent of your sin and submit to Jesus Christ the King. doesn't matter what's in your past. God's grace and forgiveness is bigger than anything you've done in your past. And it cannot, it will not keep you out if you will repent of your sin and submit to Jesus Christ as King. A couple of questions to think about as we go. How have I been tempted recently to question God's authority? God, this doesn't fit my narrative. This is not how I plan for things. This is not the way I'm used to it. This is not what I would have chosen or what I like. How have I been tempted to question God's authority? In what ways do I give only lip service to Christ and His truth? Yeah, I'll say that I'm a Christian when I'm around Christians, but if it's not very convenient, or I might get made fun of for standing for right, not getting sucked in by those who are doing wrong things and trying to draw me into it, and it's not very convenient, I won't stand, but, but I'll give lip service when it's convenient. How do I treat God's servants who are trying to direct me with his truth when I don't like the demands of his truth? Remember, it's not about the messenger. 
Your issue is not with the messenger. Your issue is with God and his truth and his demands. Let's pray together. Father, what an incredible example of patience with this landowner that he displayed towards these tenants who proved to be not only greedy and selfish, but downright murderous and hateful in their hearts. And it is a picture of your patience, your long-suffering with us, and those who reject you and resist you, giving them an opportunity to repent. But the day will come when you say, that's it, no more. No more opportunity to repent. You have resisted me long enough. I am withdrawing my spirit. And that point, at that point, that person is hopeless. They don't know it. Nobody else can know it. Only you know it. But they will be more hardened, more cold, in their hearts of stone. They will not desire to repent, just as these men refused but only sought a way to kill the Son of God. God, if there are any hearts here who have given lip service, who have made a verbal confession, but not a life confession, a life surrendered to the King of obedience, arrest those hearts today. May they surrender to Jesus the King today while there is hope and while there is time. Pray for Jesus' sake. Amen. Friend, this is not something that we can do naturally. It is not something we can do on our own. We desperately need the Lord. And it's fitting that we sing in conclusion this morning about our need for Him. So let's stand together and sing. We're acknowledging, Lord, we need you. filthy rags the righteousness of Christ in us 
His perfect, spotless righteousness, the one that you accept. It is not possible with us, but with God, all things are possible. We can be gloriously saved and justified. Thank you for that promise. We go from here rejoicing in the hope and the confidence that is ours in Christ, our salvation. We pray in his name. Amen. Tonight, 6 o'clock, Grace Bible. Hope you'll be there.